We use the word rune in modern English to refer to a series of alphabets which were used in Northern Europe from around the 2nd to the 13th century AD by speakers of Germanic languages, the various predecessors of modern English, Dutch, German and the Scandinavian languages. The word rune comes to modern English from the Latin runa, which comes from the Old Norse rune, which came with connotations also of mystery, whispering, secret advice or consultation. Old English also had the word rune, but this went extinct in the medieval period. Each individual rune of a runic alphabet corresponds to a phoneme or sound, so words are made up of individual runes. There are three known medieval runic alphabets. Firstly, there is the Elder Futhark. This is the alphabet which was used from the 2nd century until around the 7th century AD in continental Europe. It was used to represent a proto-Germanic language, the language from which all Germanic languages stem. Rune usage spread westward in the 5th century to Britain, where the Elder Futhark became the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Frisian Futhark, in use until around the 10th century AD, to represent various dialects of Old English. Back on the continent, in Scandinavia, the Elder Futhark slowly evolved into the Younger Futhark, which was in use from around the 8th century until the 14th century AD and used to represent Old Norse. This is by far the most widespread runic alphabet. Thousands of inscriptions can be found in Scandinavia alone, but its use had spread as far afield as Constantinople. These runes are even carved into the Hagia Sophia. The names for the complete runic alphabets, Futhark and Futhork, come from the sound value of the first six runes of their alphabets when in their conventional order. Unlike the word rune, though, it's a name which has been given by modern runologists to the runic alphabet. It wasn't used at the time runes were used. When we look at runes, we need to consider why they look so stylistically unlike any other alphabet, and also what exactly their unique appearance can tell us. We need to consider where they come from by looking at where they've been found, and how similar they are to other alphabets. We need to consider the three runic alphabets separately, and then we need to consider their decline, why runes were no longer used, and why they fell out of popular use. If we compare the Elder Futhark to the Greek and Latin alphabets, the Greek and Latin stylistically have a lot more in common with each other than they do with runes. Where our Latin B and Greek beta are rounded, the runic character for the same sound is angular. It has vertical staves and angled twigs. No twigs are horizontal, that is, perpendicular to its stave, and none of them have any curves. The Greek and Latin alphabets were developed for and changed by writing on paper. On paper, perpendicular connections are effortless, and curves can make writing faster. But runes were developed for a different medium entirely, because they were developed to carve into wood. When wooden slabs are taken from a tree, they still preserve the tree's grain. If markings were made alongside these grains, one, it would be hard to differentiate markings from grains, and two, the wooden slabs would become weakened and prone to snapping. If markings were made any other way, they would easily stand out from the grain and wouldn't weaken the slab. That runes have no curves and no horizontal twigs tell us that they, primarily, were carved into wood. The overwhelming majority are carved into other materials, though rock, metal or bones, where the grain of wood isn't an issue. But the runes still mostly keep their unique shape. There are around 6,000 runic inscriptions which have been found in all, and only a fraction of these are carved into wood. If one living person at a time in the world were rune literate to make all of these, they would only make six inscriptions a year. Because we know from their shapes that runes were carved into wood, 
it's likely that there is a vast, vast body of runic evidence which hasn't survived. Clearly, of the materials most likely to survive, wood is at the bottom of the list. The runic inscriptions which have survived are just not representative of how runes were used and understood at the time. Because so few inscriptions survive, but particularly because so few wooden inscriptions survive, we just can't know the kind of relationship that rune makers had with their runes. We don't know how often they made inscriptions, how the relationship with runes varied from place to place or over time. We can't even be sure how widespread runic literacy was, whether it was reserved for a few top elites, something that was shared among most freemen, or something that was found in all strata of society. We can only guess on these things, but the relationship that rune carvers had with their runes is out of our understanding. Because we understand so little, it's common to plaster over our ignorance with runes being somehow mystic or magic. We'll come back to this later. We know that other runic alphabets developed from the Elder Futhark, but we don't know where the Elder Futhark itself developed from. We don't know if it was invented by a single person at a single time, which would be very unlikely, or if it slowly developed, and while that is more likely, we don't have evidence of its development at all. Of our 6,000 runic inscriptions, less than 500 are Elder Futhark inscriptions. Not only is this not enough to chart its development, this isn't enough to form an understanding of its spread, where it originated and where it went to. On our scant evidence, three possibilities are floated. That it developed in modern Denmark, it developed along the Danube, or it developed from North Italy. Some of the earliest inscriptions that have been found were in or around Denmark, dating from the 2nd century AD. A lot of artefacts have been preserved here, but this area is also very boggy. It's more likely that knowledge of runes was brought here, and samples just survived here which didn't elsewhere. Along the river Danube, is probably the favourite explanation in academia at the moment. Early examples have been found in Ukraine, Romania and central Germany. It could be the case that runes were developed to allow for communication along this river delta, and from there it had spread deeply into the Germanic world. The third explanation is that runes had come from northern Italy through modern Switzerland and northwards. The logic here is that the Latinized Germanic people from the Roman Empire brought knowledge of Latin literacy back to their homeland, and then they sought to develop some literacy to use in their own language back at home. This was, as recently as the 1970s, the favoured explanation. But again, with only 500 Elder Futhark inscriptions, there isn't enough evidence to form a concrete answer to this question. The situation may change as more runic inscriptions are discovered, but it may also not. We may never know where runes came from. Something which is inescapable, though. Runes appear quite similar to Latin letters, which implies that the runic alphabet and Latin alphabet are in some way related. This doesn't necessarily mean that the runic scripts are descended from the Latin script. Runes also appear similar to other alphabetic letters. Latin, of course, but also Old Italic and Greek. The sound values m, t, and k, for example, appear similar in Latin, runes, Greek, and Old Italic. But runes, and in particular the Elder Futhark, also has characters which in no way resemble any of its related scripts where common sound values lie. So is the runic alphabet the offspring of Latin? Is it Latin's sibling? Or is it Latin's cousin via Greek? Your answer to this question probably varies depending on which of the three theories of runes origins you prefer. It's undeniable that Latin influence is prime on the shape of many runes, but this doesn't necessarily mean that Latin was related to the initial creation of runes. We just don't have enough evidence to be certain. 
Though the earliest inscriptions in the Elder Futhark date from the 2nd century AD, we don't have a runic alphabet, a collection of all known runes, until around 400 AD, on the Kilva stone, found in Gotland, Sweden. On this, there are all 24 runes of the Elder Futhark. When we compare the Kilva stone's Futhark to other inscriptions, like the Vadstena Bracteat, it has a few oddities. The A, S and B runes are mirrored, and the Z rune appears upside down. The F rune and W rune appear incomplete based on what they appear like elsewhere. We don't know how many of our surviving inscriptions are carved by people who are only semi-literate, people who were feigning literacy to impress. This could explain the mistakes on the Kilva stone, and explain why, in the Elder Futhark, so many inscriptions are just nonsensical to us. The Kilva stone also has two other details. A drawing of what appears to be a fir tree, and a sequence of runes spelling Sueus. The meaning of both of these are unknown. The first has been interpreted by Turja Spirkland as a bind rune of many T and A runes. This, he argues, represents the god too, and calls for his protection. The carving reading Sueus has not been explained beyond the fact that it's a palindrome, so it has been called a magical incantation. There are a lot of runic inscriptions which we just don't understand, and which don't seem to have a clear purpose. The Kielva stone is just one example. It has been common to explain these as magical incantations, which makes our imagination go wild. We should treat interpretations of magical purpose with great cynicism, and modern runologists are beginning to. Many runic inscriptions can be indecipherable, unclear in their purpose, and can have entirely contrasting interpretations. Magic is a catch-all interpretation in these cases. It can stop us from investigating further. We don't have enough surviving runic inscriptions to know the relationship that rune carvers had with their runes. It can never be fully proven or disproven that a runic inscription is magical, because we just don't know enough about the culture which used the runes. No matter how badly we want runes and inscriptions to be magic, we can't jump to this conclusion. It will harm our understanding of runes. When we can interpret Elder Futhark runes, they are also difficult to understand because we have very little working understanding of Proto-Germanic. But runic inscriptions are very similar. They usually include personal names, either of an object's maker, its owner, or of the object itself. A good example of this is found in the longest Elder Futhark inscription that we have. It was inscribed on a golden drinking horn found at Galahus in Jutland in 1734, which was apparently inscribed with runes reading, I, Hlawagastis, follower of Halt, made this horn. The context in which the horn was found, and the horn itself, are unfortunately unknown. It was stolen and melted down in 1802. But it demonstrates a pattern which we see repeated again and again. Personal names and possession of the inscribed objects are laid out. The Anglo-Frisian Futhark diverged from the Elder Futhark quite early. It looks very similar in appearance, but Old English has sound changes which require amendment of old runes and the creation of new ones. The Elder Futhark's A rune branched into three different forms, Us, Ark, and Ash. This branching off happened as early as the 5th century. The Undlibracteat has both the Urs rune and Ark rune in its inscription, which reads Gagoga Maga Medu. Gagoga appears in three bind runes. It's been interpreted both as a battle cry and, of course, as a magical invocation. It's also inscribed in the Elder Futhark on the Kragahul lance shaft which reads Gagaga, -ga -ga, again in three bind runes. Magamedu probably means rewards for the kinsmen. For details on the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, we can turn to the Old English rune poem, a poem which gives the runes of the Futhark their sound values 
and a name with which the rune is closely associated. It's very likely that the runes of the Elder Futhark had names as well, but they haven't survived. Though their names have been reconstructed, our certainty of these reconstructions varies from fairly certain to glorified guesswork. I haven't used them in this video for that reason. The Old English rune poem has been interpreted as a mnemonic device, an equivalent to songs that children sing to learn their alphabet. It's also been interpreted as a magical invocation. The former is much more likely, as the use of words for runes would assist in remembering the runes and their sound value, as we do with children learning their alphabet today. A is for apple, B is for bear, and so on. The Old English rune poem begins with feo, meaning wealth. Wealth is a benefit to all men, yet every man must share it freely if he wishes to gain glory before the Lord. The poem counts, altogether, 29 Anglo-Frisian runes. One of the runes in the poem is unattested outside of it, Eeyore, of questionable meaning and sound value. There are four more runes which the poem doesn't give a verse, which may not have been used at all. This makes for a grand total of 33 potential Old English runes, only 28 of which are part of the full Futhork. A 28 rune Futhork is attested in a few places. The most interesting is the Seax of Beognoth, a sword found in the Thames River which dates from around the 10th century. The order is different to the Old English rune poem. The first 19 runes are in the same order, but thereafter it differs. Some of the rune forms are different. This could be because the craftsman didn't know his Futhork, or it may mean that the Futhork wasn't standardised, or it could be errors from inlaying runes in metal. We can't be sure. The blade's name comes from its other runic inscription, text which reads Bergnoth in six runes. We don't know if this is a personal name of the crafter, the owner, or of the blade itself. Two runes in particular were used much more than any others. Those are the runes Thorn and Win. The Latin alphabet has no symbol to represent these sound values. Thorns is not a sound present in Latin, and though Win represents a sound in classical Latin, by late antiquity and the early medieval period, this sound value had changed to V. So these runes were used with the Latin alphabet when writing in Old English, and as such they lost their recognisable runic shape. A rune is, most often, simply a representation of its sound value. A collection of runes like this would read Christ or Christ, but particularly in Old English, the runes can also stand on their own as abbreviations for their rune name. In the poem The Ruin, man, the M rune, is a stand-in for its word in mandreama, or human joys. The poet Kunawulf signs off his poems with a minor riddle, using each rune as a stand-in for its name, to indirectly give his name as a poem's author. This means that, to unpick the name of the poet, and to understand the poem's conclusion, a reader must have some basic knowledge of the runes. From around the 8th century, the younger Futhark appears. While the Futhark was made more complicated, up to 33 runes, the younger Futhark was substantially simplified, cut from 24 runes to encompass only 16. This probably made learning the runes easier, but it massively complicates the process for us finding out what inscriptions say. Because now, single runes have to represent multiple sound values. The runes Bjork, Tyr, and Korn represent B, T, and K, but they also represent P, D, and G. In theory, a change in sound value was demarcated with dots placed on the runes, but in practice these dots were used differently by different carvers, so they are rarely helpful. For the names and meanings of these runes, we can turn to two rune poems, one Icelandic, and the other Norwegian. Both of these, written in the 13th and 15th centuries respectively, record the same sound values with mostly the same names for the runes. The Icelandic rune poem begins with Fe, 
meaning wealth, and says, Wealth is a source of discord among kinsmen, and fire of the sea, and path of the serpent. The Norwegian rune poem also begins with fair, reading, Wealth is a source of discord amongst kin. The wolf lives in the forest. This is a rhyme in Old Norse. The younger Futhark boasts probably the best known runic inscription of all, the Gelling Stone, where Harald Bluetooth, in the 10th century, made his declaration of Christianity, of Danish unity, and dedicated inscriptions to his parents, reading, King Harald ordered to make these monuments after Gorma, his father, and after Thorvi, his mother. That Harald who won for himself all Denmark and Norway, and made the Danes Christian. The Gelling Stone is only one example of a wider cultural attitude in Scandinavia, where runes were carved into stones to announce an individual's memory. There are around 3,000 examples of runestones in Scandinavia, which make up about 50% of our total runic inscriptions. There are three times more runestones alone than there are Elder Futhark and Futhark inscriptions combined. This means that, unlike many other types of runic inscription, we know a great deal about runestones. They usually come with an announcement of a personal name of the deceased, their relations to people that put up the stone, and sometimes a religion, pagan or Christian. There is a lot more to say of runestones. I might make a video on them alone. This leaves us the final example of Bergen in Norway, where an archaeological excavation revealed hundreds of runic inscriptions carved on wooden sticks. The messages that these preserve are signs of everyday life, and they hint at a banal relationship with runes, no different to our relationship with the Latin alphabet. They can be religious in a Christian sense, but they can be a parent speaking to their child. They can be amusing notes. They can also be quite explicit. Most of them date from the 13th or 14th centuries. We don't know the purpose of these runic inscriptions, whether they did serve a purpose or were just carved for the entertainment of the carver. These examples could be unique to Bergen, or this behaviour could have been repeated everywhere where we find runes. Or the answer could be somewhere in between these two. But they show a relationship with runes which is every day, and is not really associated with magic. In Britain, runes began to decline from around the 10th century onwards. This could be linked to the rise of Wessex. There has been, so far, a lack of runic evidence found in the original boundaries of the Kingdom of Wessex at all. Enough of an absence to suggest that runes were never in wide use in the area. It makes sense that, after Wessex became the dominant kingdom, and the nobles of Wessex were the most powerful, runic use would decline. The last Futhork inscriptions are found in the far north of Northumbria, at the furthest point from Wessex's cultural influence, and the last Futhork is written in the 12th century in Cambridge. With the decline of the use of runestones, the evidence of younger Futhark runes is as scant as for our others. A manuscript named the Codex Runicus records provincial law, and was written in runes in around the year 1300. This is thought less to be an example of runic survival, and more a case of individual nostalgia. Runes were probably out of common use in educated circles at this point. The modern imagination has run wild with the concept of runes. Runes have dominated modern fantasy since Tolkien used them in The Hobbit. They also feature in modern games like Deep Rune and Valheim, where they help the player with hints or with supernatural powers. In modern society, the belief that runes are supernatural is pervasive. The word rune cannot be googled without encountering a myriad of books, stories and videos which want to sell you on the magic properties of runes. These resources are crap. They are lying to you. They confuse the Elder Futhark, Futhark, Younger Futhark, Educated Guesses and Fiction into a nice easy consumable narrative at a nice easy consumable price. Much of what they say about the powers of individual runes can be traced back no further than 1908. 
In medieval contexts, the equation rune equals magic may arise from the use of runes for magical formulae. Runes need be no more magical than Roman characters, being used for early magical texts because they were the only script available. Narrative texts where runic magic is mentioned usually leave it uncertain whether the runes are magical in themselves or because of the words that they form. There is then the uncomfortable truth that runes were one of the foundations to which fascist regimes appealed. Individuals like Heinrich Himmler believed that runes were evidence of some ancient pagan past, and it's because of this belief that the Schutzstaffel chose to use two runes as its logo. But it's worth noting that even these runes, and their supposed meaning, victory, again, dates back no further than 1908. They have absolutely no basis in medieval history. Even though the belief has been used as a front for indescribable evil, it can seem, and probably is, innocuous for runes to be perceived as magical. But it's difficult not to regret, because it deprives us of the ability to enjoy runes for their historic and linguistic value. The overabundance of resources, which claim to tap into the supposed magic value and meaning of individual runes, have made the process of researching this video immensely more time consuming. And costly than it would otherwise have been. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then like and subscribe. There are a lot more rune videos coming because I have pages and pages of notes which were cut from this video. Please do share this video with your friends, as this video represents a lot of reading. Leave a comment letting me know what you think. And again, thank you.